Hello, and welcome to Every Nation Bryanston Church Online. We're so glad that you're with us today. Um, if you are new or visiting for the first time, um, we would love to know that. Um, if you're watching on Sunday morning, um, you're gonna see on our chat box, there's gonna be a link for our connection card. Um, please click on it. Let us know that you're here. If you're watching at any other time in the week on our YouTube channel, you'll see it um, down below the video. But, but we'd love to know that you're here and with us today. Um, one of the things that you're gonna see on that connection card um, is there's gonna be three charities listed. Um, three charities doing really incredible work um, in the greater Johannesburg area. And you get to choose one, you get to pick one, and we will give 100 Rand to that charity on your behalf just because you were with us today. Your presence with us matters. Um, so let us know that you were here. We'll be in touch in the week and we'd love to give that gift um, to a charity on your behalf. Um, Couple announcements before we get started. One, um, our venue will be closing down from the 15th of December. Um, we rent our space from a school. Um, they'll be closing down from the 15th. So the 12th of December is going to be our last in-person gathering for the year. And we're gonna make it really fun. Um, it's gonna kind of be, I love Christmas. For those of you who don't know me, I just, I love Christmas so much. So I'm kind of excited about the 12th. We're gonna do carols. Um, I don't know who those of you who were there um, for our hymn Sunday, but we're gonna do carols. Um, just really spend time like sitting with Christmas carols, being in that moment together. Um, where it will, Siv's gonna preach the word, and then afterwards we're gonna go to the field, have a meal together, hang out, just have a great time. So, um, oh, and it's Baby Dedication Sunday. That's the other thing. So it's gonna be a great Sunday. Um, if you can make it, um, sign up online. It's gonna be, it's probably gonna be packed, so make sure you sign up, but that will be the last in-person gathering for the year. So it'll be a fun, um, just packed Sunday as we kind of celebrate um, the end of the year together um, in person anyways. Um, and then we will be reopening in person um, on the 9th. The 9th of January will be our first in-person gathering um, in the new year. So we'll have three weeks where we'll still be here online um, every Sunday, but um, in terms of, terms of in-person gatherings, just make sure you block off um, the dates between the 12th and the 9th. So in light of that, um, if you were still wanting to donate any goods to Green Door um, or Reshamele Primary School, um, both in Deep Sloot, if you were wanting to, to donate any goods to them, if you could have them to the church venue um, by the 5th of December, that would be greatly appreciated. Then we will have time <clears throat> that following week to get the goods um, delivered to them. Um, so we'll, we'll put those slides up again just so you can see those needs if you were still wanting to make any donations. But if you could do so, by the 5th um, so that we have that week to get it delivered to them. We, you guys, are starting our Advent series this Sunday and I am so excited about it. Advent means, um, it's a Latin word and it, and it means coming. I um, mean, Advent has, has been the church's way of, of observing and remembering and marking the truth that we believe that God came that God came, that God is still with us, and that God is coming again. Um, so we want to enter this Advent season as we prepare for Christmas in these coming weeks. Um, we want to we want to pause. We want to slow down for a minute. Um, I think there's something we forget that living in the 21st century and we have. Bibles readily available, and, and we know the truth that Jesus was fully God and fully man. We have that hindsight now. But I think there's something about rewinding and just sitting for a moment with the fact that God put on flesh. As Eugene Peterson says in the message translation, he, he moved into the neighborhood. Um, so we're gonna do that this Advent season. We're gonna rewind a bit. We're going to not let um, what we know to be true of Jesus' divinity overshadow what we learn and see from him in his humanity. So we're gonna go there. We're gonna dig deep into the humanity of Jesus and we're going to allow the vulnerability of that, the beauty of that, the seeming impossibility of it. If we're honest with ourselves, there's so much about it that just seems near impossible, but we're gonna let ourselves sit there um, to be with Jesus in his humanity and, and look at what that um, speaks to us about our own humanity. The, the, the dignity that it, it speaks to our own human experience and also let it 
Let it reorient, reshift, and recenter our view of God in light of the humanity of Jesus. So, we are kicking off this series this week. The Word became flesh, and I'm so excited. There's, um, we have a guide that we've put together for our connect groups. Um, there will be a link to it that you can click to the side. But even if you're not using it in your connect group or if you're not in a connect group, I would encourage you to download this guide and be intentional over the coming weeks. Create space in your life as the year comes to an end, as you get ready to maybe go home and be with family, use this as a tool. Maybe it's, um, maybe you spend time reflecting on the questions and journaling, but, but I would just encourage you to really create space in this season to allow yourself to sit with the withness, the humanness of God putting on flesh and being with us. Have you ever had a moment when you asked, am I crazy? Am I making this whole story up? This, no, I'm gonna start again. Have you ever had a moment in your faith when you asked, am I crazy? Am I making this whole story up? Is this just a fairy tale to make me feel good? Has that moment ever become a day? And has that day ever become a week? And has that week ever become a month? And that month, a season of your life? If so, you are not alone. You are in good company. Today, I'm gonna to talk about three people who experienced that question. They doubted. I'm gonna open with Mary, the mother of our Lord. I'm gonna talk about Thomas, who gets a terrible bad rap for being the doubter, but I'm gonna talk about him. And then I'm gonna talk about John the baptizer. So first, Mary, why are we opening a, a, a series on Advent, on the leading up to Christmas, on the leading up to the celebration with such a Scrooge message, such a Grinch stole Christmas message on doubt. Well, it's because at the very beginning of Jesus's life, in the life of his mother, there was doubt. Let's read this story out of Luke 1, verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you will name him Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So I want to quickly set the context for this moment. For hundreds of years, 
Jews would have been familiar with the prophecies of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah was written 700 years prior to the life of Jesus. Isaiah 7 verse 14 says this, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall name him Emmanuel. But this event, this Emmanuel, that God would be with us, was not interpreted as a kind of a literal event of a woman to be with child and bear a son. It was more a view that God would kind of come in and be with his people and deliver them from whether it's Roman occupation or whatever um, oppression they were facing. But it was viewed more as a powerful leader than it was actually God becoming flesh and becoming a man. Tim Keller explains it this way. Jews believed in a God who was both personal and infinite, who was not a being without, within the universe, but was instead the ground of its existence and infinitely transcendent above it. Everything in the Hebrew worldview militated against the idea that a human being could be God. Jews would not even pronounce the name Yahweh or even spell it. So think of this, Mary has an angel on the scene, essentially saying that she's going to bear the Son of God, that she will conceive of the Spirit. And the context with which she understood God was his name is too holy to be uttered. This idea of to be conceived of the Spirit was highly improbable in light of her, the history of her faith. This was the God who when the Ark of the Covenant was being carried in and an oxen kind of stumbled, this man named Uzas kind of tried to help the Ark of the Covenant, this thing that represented God's presence. She tried to stabilize it and immediately he was struck dead. This was the God who only enabled the certain Levites, um, the certain tribe, the holiest, into the holiest of holies. Only one group of people were allowed into the most inner sanctuary where God's presence dwelled because God's presence was set apart. So naturally, Mary's response is one of curiosity. This feels highly improbable. It says, Mary was perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this would be. Other versions say she was greatly troubled and worried. In light of the context I just said, you can imagine why she's greatly troubled and worried. The message said, says she was thoroughly shaken. So what causes Mary to question? An angel is before her, telling her something that's contrary to her kind of system of belief. For her understanding of God, it was simply too improbable to believe what she was being told. It's too far-fetched. What is it for you? Your belief is going fine. You have your system of belief in place, and then, bam, you hit a point of doubt. For Mary, it's, this story seems too improbable. In my life, when I've experienced that moment of kind of doubt and question, it's generally been precipitated by one of, one of a few things. One is the improbability. This feels too far-fetched. Secondly, it's the challenges that I see with Christians. It's what Gandhi said. I like your Christ. I don't like your Christians because your Christians look nothing like your Christ. Sometimes Christians themselves can send us into doubt. Wait, if that's Christian, is that what I believe? Or third, challenges with the Bible. How do I reconcile what I read in, in the text and, the, and what, I, what I study in school? How do I reconcile science and Genesis or, thing, or questions like that? A fourth one, pain, suffering, terror. Those moments of incredible human pain send us into doubt. Is God really who he says he is? Is God my protector? Or silence, simply silence. Mother Teresa battled doubt because of silence. In 1979, she wrote a letter in which she says to um, the person she was writing it to, she, she says, Jesus has a very special love for you. As for me, the silence and the emptiness is so great that I look and I do not see, I listen and I do not hear. 
these moments that cast us into a question of doubt, returning to Mary, it was simply, this story seems too improbable. The word pondered there doesn't translate very well into English. What it actually literally means is to make an audit of. It's an accounting word. It's to look for the factual evidence for something. If you've ever had an experience with auditors, as an investor, I have, and what I've often found with auditors, God love them, is they want the specific kind of written documentation for decisions taken. You generally like make a decision, agree between parties, and then allow for the accountants to kind of change the financial statements according to the agreement. Auditors don't accept that. They want to see the written agreements in place in order to validate what you're doing in the accounting statements. That makes sense. This is that word, pondered. It's to make an audit. Mary was making an audit of the situation. Mary's response, her faith response, is one of her whole being, including her intellect. She's studying the situation in her mind. What has been most of our experience with doubt? I'm gonna guess it's one of two things. The first is like delusion. You close your ears, la 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 la, it's just, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear those questions and I avoid them entirely. There's kind of live in this la-la de delusional land. The second and probably most more, more common is a defense. For some reason, I picture the defense being kind of a youth leader chastising the, the kid, being like, why are you doubting? Just believe. I'm not sure why I picture that. But that response, the defense response, I can kind of empathize with it in some way. I can understand why. It's coming from a place of fear. What if I'm right? What if my questions are right? Where will that take me? Therefore, don't even go down that road. It's fear that gets us to that point. Or it's insecurity. What if I don't have the, 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 the ability to figure out if I'm right or wrong? So, so, so I just push it out. I push out the question because I'm not sure how to, how to navigate this complex question. Or worse yet, we do this because we don't know who God is. We believe God to be a cruel taskmaster, chastising us for, for not believing perfectly at all times. The challenge here, the challenge here is our faith is more viewed as a fortress to be protected rather than a road to be journeyed. But Mary, sweet Mary, probably 14 to 16 year old Mary. She introduces us to a third way, this way of humble engagement. That's how she engages with her question. First, she's confused. She begins to audit the situation and she says nothing. Second, she responds with this humble and honest deliberation. How can this be since I am a virgin? And then third, she moves almost into kind of a simple acceptance. Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be according to your word. See, Mary gives us a, res a, a model to deal with our doubt, to respond to our questions. And that's kind of what I want to unpack today. And that's why we're starting a series on Advent with this question of, do I even believe the story that we profess that leads up to Jesus' birth. Before I get into that a little bit more, I want to just open with a word on doubt. Doubt derives, get this, from the same root words as duo or double. It's, it's almost as if doubt is to be of, of double minds, to be of two minds, duo minds, one that believes and then one that does not believe. But here's what doubt is not. We often think that doubt is unbelief. Doubt is not the same as unbelief. Unbelief is a stubborn refusal to believe, but doubt is actually a striving for a struggle to believe. It's, I wanna believe, but I can't quite reconcile this question that's kind of in my heart. I can't quite reconcile this what I've learned and this what I read, or this what I see in Christians and this what I believe of God's character. And so it's a struggle to believe. When you doubt, it's a sign that there's something in you that desires pure truth. Look at Mary's response. She's pondering within herself. 
auditing the situation. Doubt is also not the same as skepticism. We live in an age of skepticism, perhaps more skeptical than any other time in history. Just look at the skepticism about the vaccine. That's not meant to be a political statement in any way, but the fact that even I have to caveat it, that it's not a political statement, shows that there's incredible skepticism about science today. And the doubt um, that we kind of face today, it, it's kind of the air that we breathe. Now, it's not right perspective, but it is common perspective. And here's the common perspective today about doubt. Doubt is for the intellectual. It's for the sophisticated, you know, the thoughtful, the tolerant, the cultured. It's, uh, it's for the smart ones. But it's the simple-minded that have faith. Faith is for those who maybe just aren't smart enough. Dallas Willard said this, we live in a culture that has for centuries now cultivated the idea that the skeptical person is always smarter than the one who believes. You can almost be as stupid as a cabbage as long as you doubt. The fashion of the age has identified mental sharpness with a pose, not with genuine intellectual method and character. Most of our experience with doubt, if it wasn't in the delusion and the defense, it's probably in this category of kind of um, skepticism, intellectual and academic superiority. That's not the doubt I'm talking about today. The doubt I'm talking about today is Mary's model of humble engagement, of deliberating over something. Lord, let it be according to your word, seeking truth in the questions, to be of two minds at the same time. But from the beginning of Jesus' life, I now wanna jump to the end of his life. And the old, our old friend Thomas, who gets such a bad rap for being the doubter. But let's read why. So this is out of John 20, verse 24 to uh, 29. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the 12, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other, other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. My understanding of this, of this verse, I think for years was that you are blessed when you believe because you have not seen, which is true for all of us. None of us have seen Jesus. I could be wrong, but likely none of us have seen Jesus, and yet we believe. So, hashtag blessed. That's actually not what I think Jesus is getting at. It wasn't until the last couple of weeks when I feel like it's become clear to me what Jesus was getting at. This is not a lesson in seeing versus believing. It is Jesus addressing Thomas and the specific provision that Thomas relied on to validate his beliefs in God. In this case, that specific provision was the life of Jesus. And what Jesus is saying to him is, blessed are you when that specific way in which you've believed, you no longer have it, when you don't see anymore and yet you believe. What's the one area of your life that validates kind of your um, the, 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 the thing that, that, that lets you know that God is real. Maybe it's God has led you in your vocation and in your career, and you've watched God open doors that seemed impossible to open, and you've watched him lead you vocationally, and that's become kind of this thing that you've relied on to, to validate your belief in God. Blessed are you when that's no longer there, and yet you believe. Maybe it's your finances, and... Over time, you've seen God continually come through in your financial need. And then one day, 
the finances dry up, and it doesn't seem like God comes through. Blessed are you when you believe, despite having that common warn. I think what Jesus is saying here is, blessed are you when the common path, the familiar way, that kind of worn out road that's given you assurance that God exists is no longer there, and yet you believe. In this way, when, when that common path is gone, doubt can actually take us deeper. See, a third response to doubt, if it's not delusion and if it's not defense, is a healthy deconstruction. We all know what unhealthy deconstruction looks like. It's what I started with today. The cynicism and the sarcasm, this kind of intellectual superiority. It's kind of an unhealthy deconstruction. It's deconstruction for the sake of deconstructing. But what I'm getting at is a healthy deconstruction. It's the merry engagement. Here I am, let it be according to your word. But we fear deconstruction. We think that somehow deconstruction will tear down this fortress that we have so carefully built up. But here's the question I would pose to you today. If there is no deconstruction, if construction, if the construction of your faith, the fortress of your faith is complete, how do you know that you got it all right? When Jesus stepped on the scene, first century Jewish te teachers, the Pharisees, believed they got it all right. And Jesus confronted that directly in perhaps the most famous speech ever recorded in history. In fact, Google it. When you Google most famous speeches of all time, generally Jesus' Sermon on the Mount comes up. So Jesus is now confronting the first century Jewish, Jewish teachers of the law. He says this, you've heard that it was said in those ancient times that you shall not murder, but I say to you, those five simple words, but I say to you. It's, it's almost as if it implies that the traditional beliefs are true, but somehow they're insufficient and incomplete. Do you follow me? He's confronting the conventional belief and he's building upon it. He's challenging it with these five simple words, but I say to you. And he does this six times here in the Sermon on the Mount. You've heard it said that you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you. You've heard it said that whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce, but I say to you. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you. You've heard it said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemies, but I say to you. He continually confronts the traditional belief and he says these beliefs actually need to be challenged. They need to be expanded. They need to be deconstructed, reinterpreted, and yes, even doubted. You see, good deconstruction. Good deconstruction is when we actually realize that something we believe about Jesus may not actually be Jesus at all. Something we believe about God may not be God at all. And we realize this is wrong and this has to change in my life. It's again, believing that our faith in God is not a fortress simply to be protected, but a road to be journeyed. C.S. Lewis says this, my idea of God is not a divine idea. It has to be shattered from time to time. He shatters it himself. Could we not almost say that this shattering is one of the marks of his presence? Oh, that just hits me. My idea of God is not a divine idea. It has to be shattered from time to time. He shatters it himself. Could we not almost say that this shattering is one of the marks of his presence? As soon as you stop deconstructing, as soon as you stop allowing your faith to be reinterpreted, re-examined, you've boxed God in. And in that moment, you start becoming God and he no longer is. Because he is more than we can possibly fathom and imagine. Returning to Thomas, 
know what's crazy what happened with Thomas's life? After this moment, this is the last recorded moment where Jesus kind of rebukes him. It says, blessed are you, Thomas, when the common road to God is gone, and yet you believe. And that's kind of it between Thomas and Jesus. But you know what Thomas goes on to do? He went on to become a missionary in India, landing on the Malabar coast in AD 52, 50 years after Jesus' death. Today, there are approximately 4 million St. Thomas Christians in India. If you meet an Indian, a Christian Indian with the surname Thomas, he or she descended from this small community that started with a doubter 2,000 years ago. So you are not alone. All right, let's turn to John the Baptist. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, no, man, this guy's got it wrong. There's no way John the Baptist was a doubter. But let's read it um, together. So this is Matthew 11, verse 2. Might be one of my favorite little, um, little sections of the Gospels. I've just been reading this over and over again this week. When John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. Do you hear what John is asking? He's asking if Jesus is the Messiah. Now, that's not necessarily an odd question. A lot of people in the Gospels ask that question. But what is incredibly interesting and baffling is that John's asking this in Matthew 11. John's asking this halfway through the book of Matthew. This is the same John who leapt in his mother's womb when Mary, who was pregnant with Jesus, walked in the room. This is the same John who, who when, when Jesus was wanting to be baptized, said, am I to, to baptize you? I'm not even worthy to loose the, sandal on your, the, the strap on your sandal. This is the same John who, when some of his disciples left, to follow Jesus' disciples, John's response was, no, he must increase that I might decrease. It's the same John who earlier declared that this was the Messiah. He called in John 1, he says, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the same John who's now saying, are you the one or do we wait for another? So what has changed in John's life? He's now in prison. We we find out later why he's actually in prison. The, the, The Roman governor of this area was a man named Herod, and John called out Herod because Herod took his own brother's wife to be his own wife, and John called him it out as unlawful. And so now he's in prison. And in this point of his, of prison, he's beginning to question, and he asks, are you the one or do we wait for another? How many of us can relate to John here? We believe certain things to be true and then our circumstances change and we ask, are you the one? Are you the Messiah? Are you the God? Are you the protector? We're working a good job. Everything's going well. And then boom, my section 189 retrenchment letter. letter. Everything's seemingly healthy and then suddenly somebody is lost close to me, or a car accident, and we go, whoa, whoa, whoa. This is John's whoa, whoa, whoa moment. He's now in prison, and his circumstances have materially changed, and now he's saying, are you the one, or do we wait for another? And look at Jesus' response. Jesus' response almost seems cold and mean. Jesus tells John things he already knows to be true. He tells him, the blind receive sight, the lame walk. There are miracles among us. He's kind of saying like, look what you see. Look what you hear and see and tell him that. It kind of seems cold. But layer in the context here, okay? Jesus and John would have both been well studied in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 61 verse 1 says this. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because the Lord has appointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. 
He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom from the captives and release darkness for the prisoners. Now turn back to Matthew 11 and do you hear the similarities between that prophecy in Isaiah and now what Jesus is saying? Tell them what you hear and see. It's the exact same thing that said in Isaiah 61. The poor have the, have the good news proclaimed to them. But there's one simple difference. There's one simple difference that Jesus does not say. He does not say in Matthew 11 the same thing that's true in Isaiah. Proclaim freedom for prisoners. Jesus is saying, I'm not coming for you, John. I'm not going to fulfill the expectation that you place on me today. And blessed are you when you don't take offense because of this. Oh, this is Jesus' way of saying, yes, John, I'm the Messiah. You see, he had to speak in a cryptic way. If he had just said, I'm the Messiah, he would have been arrested and, and stoned or, or, or put in jail. So he had to speak in this cryptic way by referring to Isaiah. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. Look at what you hear and see. But he omits strategically John's very circumstance. John is in prison and Jesus does not say, I'll, I'll release you from prison. You're well off. You're blessed. When the expectations that you place on God are not fulfilled and yet you still believe and you don't take offense because of him. I find it just absolutely incredible what Jesus does not say to John. Man, he, he doesn't say, how dare you? My cousin, you saw the dove descend on me when I was being baptized. You, you, you heard the voice from heaven, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. You, we've been with you since, since we were children together and since you felt the spirit move of my, on my presence in, in, your, in your life. This was his closest friend. This was Jesus' closest friend who's doubting, who's saying, are you, are you the one? And Jesus doesn't chastise him. He rather simply says, you're blessed when you don't stumble because of this, because of me. How many of you need to hear that today? Jesus is not afraid of his best friend's doubts. Jesus recognized that faith and doubt are companions on the same journey. Like, doubt itself isn't necessarily a bad thing. To stay in doubt is an absolutely terrible thing. It's absolutely destructive. But I read this week, like, doubt is, is to faith what, what silence is to music. Doubt is a, is a companion to faith. It's the, it's the pregnant pause in the song before the, before the song comes back on. It's that moment of, of, of pause before the beat drops. It's, the, it's that feeling of before the beauty of the song comes back, but, but that moment of silence gives, that, gives the song meaning. You see, our end goal isn't a life free of doubt. Our end goal is a life full of trust. John Mark Comer says that the opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is certainty and control. Therefore, define success as trust, not as certainty. I want to unpack that a little bit. The goal is not to never doubt, but rather it's despite your doubt to trust. You see, knowledge of truth doesn't require full 100% certainty. Do you know the distance to the moon? Sure, 384,000 kilometers. But how do you know that? You've never measured it. You don't have full certainty yourself. You trust somebody else. You see, knowledge of truth doesn't require a, a full degree of certainty. There comes a point where there's simply trust. The opposite of, of, of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is full certainty. We'll never have 100% certainty, but neither will somebody who doesn't believe. You see, this is Jesus' invitation to John. Blessed are you when you don't take offense because of me. When I don't give you the full certainty, John, that you seek, when I don't fulfill every expectation that you have of me, blessed are you because you yet trust. 
Returning to Mary. I want to return to Mary as we conclude. This is meant to be a Christmas lead up message. <laughs> Merry Christmas. But in returning to Mary, do you know what takes Mary from the place of simple, kind of takes her into the place of simple trust? It's community. What do we do when our moment of doubt that I opened with becomes a day and that day kind of lingers into a week or a month? What do we do? I wanna leave you today with three practical things. The first is engage in community. The second is engage in worship. And the third is engage with Jesus. So first to engage in community. This story um, of Mary. So after the angel departs from her, she says, Lord, let it be according to your word. And then the angel leaves. And Mary goes and sees her friend. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to, to a Judean town in the hill country where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud voice, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. You see, before Mary visits Elizabeth, she dealt with her, 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 her doubts kind of in her mind. We read earlier, she, she pondered what this means. She asked the question, how can this be? I'm a virgin. And then she kind of simply accepted like, well, let it be according to your word. She moved to simple trust, but it doesn't get into her heart until she engages in community with her friend, Elizabeth. You hear it in her tone. You can almost hear the song erupt from her heart. My soul magnifies the Lord. You know the best thing that you can do when you have a problem? This is, this is just pure science. Help somebody with that same problem. You're battling career stagnation? Go and help somebody who's battling career stagnation. You're bat somebody, you've lost a loved one? The best thing you can do is to go and love somebody who's lost a loved one. So if you're dealing with doubts, go and be with somebody who's, who's dealing with doubts and encourage them. Speak into their life, engage in community, and, 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 and our questions and our, and our trust moves from our head to our heart. My soul magnifies the Lord. Secondly, continue to engage in worship. Continue to simply come to, 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 to church, to your community, whatever that might look like. Because you'll be inclined when you're doubting, when you're of those two minds, when the music stops and there's silence, you'll be inclined to just say, you know what, I'm going to take a break from, from church for a while. I'm going to take a break from community, from worship. Matthew 28, 17, the very end of Matthew, it says, Now when the disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. This is post Jesus' resurrection. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Continue to come and worship even in your doubts. Even in those moments of question, continue to come and worship. Remember what Jesus says to John's disciples. Do you remember? It was, go and tell John what you hear and see. There's something beautiful that happens in us when we continue to come and hear and see, even if we're struggling in our, in, our, in our self with questions and with doubts, continue to come to hear and see. A man with an experience is so much more valuable than a man with an argument. Continue to come and experience to hear and see. And then third, continue to engage with Jesus. How does Jesus respond to our doubt? Touch my wounds. Touch my wounds, engage with me. Feel for yourself the marks in my flesh. 
to, to show you that this is me. He says that to his disciples when they're doubting. Engage with me. He doesn't say, no, 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 hold on. Go back and read the prophecies in Isaiah. Study what I did in my life and see how it fulfills the prophecies and idea. No, he says, engage with me. Better yet, in Luke, you know what it says? It says, while they were still wondering and disbelieving, Jesus says, have you anything to eat? You can almost hear him disarming their doubts with simple human things like eating. So what do you do with you when you're doubting? Continue to engage with community. Eat with your community. Continue to worship. Continue to engage with Jesus despite your doubts. Your doubts don't disqualify you. That shows you're struggling for truth. You're struggling to find the, the, the common road even when it's gone, to find where is God in the midst of this. That shows that there's this like genuine desire for truth. During a time of my life when I was in one of those moments of silence, when the music seemed to quiet, a friend of mine sent me a, a song. <laughs> and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you the lyrics of the song because it just, it, it just, it just kind of met me. It took, it took kind of my, my questions from my head to my heart. I knew much more when I was younger, before the world had turned to gray. Eyes wide with fire, heart filled with hunger, confidently on my way. Certainty is an old friend that I vaguely recognize. It got complex when the foolish things confounded all the wise. I suppose that no one knows just how perplexed I am, but I know you understand. But I refuse to be a cynic, because anyone can tear things down. For me to build, I must be in it. I've got more to lose before I'm found. And I don't understand you, but my hands are reaching toward you. I just want to love the way you first loved me. I have known your kindness with no kind of condition, and you don't need my permission to exist in mystery. Let's pray. Jesus, um, thank you for this morning, and thank you for every person who's listening in right now. I just pray, God, that, um, that your presence would be, would be known despite the questions that are being asked, despite perhaps those who are listening are, being, are, are of, of two minds, of a double mind. God, I pray that you would continue to engage with us. Jesus, you came once and you are coming again. We celebrate your birth. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. Hey guys, I hope that this word was um, really meaningful to you today. I hope it spoke to you deeply and I hope you're excited to go on this journey um, together this Advent season. Um, and as we do, we just wanna close and leave you with our blessing. Um, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May his kingdom come in and through you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. To you I bow, almighty one For you are high upon the throne Let all your people stand in awe Of love and mercy you have shown To you I bow, almighty one For you are high upon the throne Standing on of love and mercy you have shown. So
stars Imagine seeing them resound To you I bow, mighty one And at your feet I fall amazed And in this heart my vow will be A life I give to you in praise Mighty one, oh, 